There's a crisp hint of autumn in the air when a young Adele Breeze first catches sight of the mysterious figure. It's October 1859. Adele carries her bag of wheat toward the grist mill in a wooded patch of northern Wisconsin when she freezes, frightened. There, between a hemlock and maple tree, stands a beautiful woman clothed in dazzling white, wearing a yellow sash and crown of stars atop her flowing golden hair until she's gone. The vision of the woman fades and Adele, all alone, continues on her way. A second encounter with the mystery woman a few days later is just as startling, compounded by the fact this figure doesn't say a word. On counsel from a priest, Adele is prepared for her next encounter and says to the figure, In God's name, who are you and what do you want from me? I am the Queen of Heaven who prays for the conversion of sinners, the woman says, and I wish you to do the same. The Queen of Heaven, the Blessed Virgin Mary, proceeds to explain to Adele what she's being called to do. Teach the children of this wild country what they should know for their salvation, while also encouraging Adele that she's not going to have to do it alone. She wants to help us. That's what she promises. I will help you. And uh, I, I think that don't forget that. And that, you know, in all the battles we face, if we realize heaven is with us, well, then it makes the, makes the battle a little easier to endure, I suppose. Welcome to the Faithful Podcast, especially to new listeners and supporters. I'm your host, Tony Ganser, and on today's program, we continue our series on the only Catholic Church-approved Marian apparition site in the United States, and we hear how the words given to Adele can help us all. That's to come on Faithful. Adele Breeze was a Belgian immigrant who settled with her family in rural northern Wisconsin at a time of challenge for Catholic evangelism in the countryside. Their missionary priests uh, serving the settlements in the area were doing a fine job, but there are unique linguistic and cultural barriers to serving an immigrant population. In our last episode, Gearing Up for This Pilgrimage, our first guide, Father Carlos, described the apparition site as sitting between dairy farms. But in the mid-19th century, it's wooded territory. According to a prayer book for pilgrims to Champion, Wisconsin, by Father Edward Looney, Adele Breeze was known as a pious girl, blinded in one eye at a young age. She loved God and the Blessed Mother Mary and promised Mary she would join a religious order to teach the faith to children abroad. But then she and her family immigrate to the U.S. before she can become a nun in Belgium. So this is the backdrop to a string of miracles at Champion and the apparition of Mary, including protection from a massive wildfire. We'll hear more about that in a little while. This is considered a private revelation, meaning faithful Catholics don't have to believe in it, but the Church has vetted what happened at Champion as not being contrary to the faith, with a local bishop saying it is, quote, worthy of belief. The Guadalupe, Fatima, Lourdes apparition sites are also considered private revelations, just for context. To find out more, I found the one who wrote the book on this apparition site. Father Edward Looney, pastor of St. Francis, St. Mary Parish, Brussels, St. Peter and St. Hubert Parish, Lincoln, Rosaire, author, podcaster, host of How They Love Mary and Cup of St. Joe. Father Edward met with me after saying Mass for Relevant Radio in Green Bay, and he answered some of the big questions about Champion I had, like, why don't more people know about it? The Champion apparition really isn't well known, and that is a fact. In fact, I go lots of different places, and I talk about it, and they're like, what are you talking about? There's a Marian apparition in the United States. And I say, yes, it's in Champion, Wisconsin. It took place in 1859, and it was recently approved in 2010 by the bishop of the diocese, Bishop David Ricken. And with Fatima, you had the miracle of the sun, and it was witnessed by 
thousands, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people, right? So, so of course, news naturally spreads. It's the front page story on every newspaper. Uh, in, in Lourdes, you have the healings that are taking place, this spring of water that wasn't there and Bernadette uncovers it. So I think quite naturally, those apparitions kind of took off. People knew about them because people were talking about them. But we're talking 1859, there's no TV programs out there, no radio programs. You just have a simple Belgian immigrant who's walking along a nature trail and sees the Blessed Mother. She tells her family, she tells her priest. It seems more of a local apparition. In fact, it was kind of speaking to what was going on in the area at the time, that there was a lack of the practice of the faith on the part of the immigrants. And so it seems like Mary came to renew the faith of the area by her apparition. So it, it, it's very local, but then the bishop approves it and it kind of catapults it on a, a larger stage. And I think the message, which is conversion of life, right? Pray for the conversion of sinners. Well, that's a message for everybody. That's just not a local message. Gather the children and teach them what they need to know for salvation. Well, that's, that's for everybody. That's not just a local message. So I think the approval then brought it to the forefront. But I always say to people, if you were sleeping on December 8th, 2010 in the Catholic news world, and you didn't read all of the reports that day, well, then you probably don't know about Champion. And so it's the different documentaries or TV shows or radio programs or podcasts that are out there now that are really helping us share the message to spread uh, this apparition. And, and they do see it. They see an uptick in pilgrims. Yeah. Do you think, um, was there something preventing news from spreading for 150 years? Or was it just kind of... Eh, was it lack of interest? Was it uh, lack of awareness? Um, a combination of a lot of things which prevented it, it from spreading previously? Yeah, you know, it never was condemned or anything like that. Uh, it always received the favor of the local bishop. He would come often uh, to the chapel, uh, as, and especially in the 1900s, after the visionary dies, the church enjoyed its time at the shrine. Uh, there, there was even a nuncio, I think a Belgian nuncio one time, came to the shrine and championed. So, so the church always looked at it, recognized it in an unofficial way, but never in an official way. I just think that it wasn't a hot topic of conversation. That, that was probably it. Uh, there, there's no good reason why it didn't really take off. Now, you would have thought in 1871, there's this fire that breaks out in Peshtigo, Wisconsin. And, you know, they say that the fire came across the bay and began to burn in that area. And Adele takes a statue and processes with all the faithful there. And you would have thought that would have been front page news story. Right. You know, fire happens in Wisconsin, shrine to Blessed Mother, chapel of Blessed Mother and and nuns spared or something, but it's overshadowed. And why is it overshadowed? Because the very same day the Chicago fire takes place. So what could have been a very popular story, probably on par with the miracle of the sun or the, the spring of water, this, this so-called quasi-miracle of the fire, it's not officially recognized as a miracle, but we call it that, uh, really could have, could have brought it into the public eye for sure yeah we're we're gonna go to the fire museum and there's the i guess the preserved tabernacle which yeah. was not destroyed yeah. um i think but, it was found in the water maybe father peter pernan was the pastor and in fact this father peter pernan he wrote a book called the finger of god and now i it's not clear to me if he actually went there and saw this or if this is just oral record and he heard it and so he repeated it. But what he described about the Champion Shrine was that it shone out like an emerald island amid a sea of ash. And so everything else had been burnt. And, you know, the historical record says that the outsides were charred but not the insides. So, you know, it really was the protection of Mary's prayers, her mantle, uh, protecting this holy spot. Just a quick aside, Peshtigo, Wisconsin is nearly an hour north of Green Bay and the apparition site near Green Bay. The fire museum in Peshtigo records the devastation of this fire. This was a woodenware factory that was the largest in the world. 
because they were even shipping over to Europe. There were none there. Mm -hmm. uh, as a result of, they did a lot of work there. All that sawdust would start on fire, so they paved the streets with sawdust. 1,200 people lived in the city, and over this map shows the amount of land that was burned. It was 1.2 million acres. Outside the museum is a cemetery with historical markers telling in narrative form some of the tragedy suffered by these people because of the fire. There's also a a mass grave. It's a place that really gives pause. I offered a prayer there. Another miracle during this fire, along with the Champion Shrine site being an emerald isle in a sea of ash, was the tabernacle of the local church being untouched. The tabernacle is the chamber which holds the Blessed Sacrament, which Catholics believe becomes Jesus through the course of the celebration of the Mass. The priest ran to secure the tabernacle during the fire, but lost track of it somehow during the chaos of the night. It was found in pristine condition after the fire had burned away. The sacraments are keys to the Catholic faith, and Father Edward Looney says they were central to the apparitions for Adele Breeze as well. In a sense, it was a personal apparition. It gave a mission to Adele gather the children, teach them what they need to know for salvation. Mary specifically addresses personal questions. Why are you standing here in idleness while your companions are working in the vineyard of my son? So, so it is a very personal call of the Blessed Mother, but I think that when Mary speaks, we should be attentive to what she's saying. We want to listen to the words of the Blessed Mother. I, I wrote this book, A Lenten Journey with Mother Mary, which was all about listening to Mary's voice and then living her messages all throughout the Lenten season. And so I think there's a lot there in the champion apparition. Yes, for Adele, but also for, for all of us. Mary says, I'm the queen of heaven who prays for the conversion of sinners, and I wish you to do the same. Well, that's an invitation for you and me to pray for the conversion of sinners. Mary tells us her name, for example. I'm the queen of heaven. She tells us what she does, that she intercedes. And really, in, in the Old Testament, we see that the, uh, the queen was the mother of the son, and the queen always advocated, interceded for the common people. So this is what Mary does. And so that's the story of, of her name and her mission. But she goes on. She tells Adele, you know, go to Mass, receive Holy Communion, offer your communion for the conversion of sinners. Well, every Mass we go to now, we can offer our communion for the conversion of sinners. Make a general confession. Well, we're all in need of God's mercy. Um, Blessed are those who believe without seeing. That Mary quotes her, the words of her son. And those words really, I think, are an affirmation to all the pilgrims that go there, that you haven't seen Mary here. You've heard the story. You believe it to be true. And so you go. Um, why are you standing here in idleness? Well, for all of us, there, there's times that we kind of drag our feet on different things. That, And I think this is especially the case, for example, during Lent. Like, okay, you know, I'm going to do this, and then, then you don't really. Or... You know, why delay, why delay to tomorrow when we can do it today? And that's what I think Mary's saying to Adele. You've waited four years to be a sister. Why aren't you doing this yet? Um, gather the children. Teach them what they need to know for salvation. Uh, this is the heart of the message of catechesis, of wanting people to know the faith. So, um, yeah, these are some of the lessons that Mary taught there. And Sure, lived by Adele, but lived by her companions, lived by all of us who still hear it today. Um, you traveled to Belgium uh, as, as yes. part of your research for this. And I wonder if you can maybe connect what you learned a little more there to what Adele was going through and also what the community was going through at that time. Yeah, so uh, really the purpose for my trip to Belgium was uh, I wanted to research the title of Mary, Our Lady of Good Help. This is what the shrine is known as, but it's very peculiar that the shrine is called that because Mary appears and she says, I'm the Queen of Heaven who prays for the conversion of sinners. It's not the revealed name of the Blessed Mother. 
Um, so, so I was, I wanted to know more. I wanted to learn more about what we call Notre Dame de Bon Secours. What I did know was that Adele had a devotion to Mary under the seal. It mm. says in the historical book, well, she wanted that name inscribed above the door of the church. So she had a devotion. So I wanted to find it. And I found a few basilicas to Notre Dame de Bon Secours and, and, uh, you know, trying to trace the history of it. So. You know, for uh, for the 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 reason for immigration, um, uh, Adele and her parents immigrate here, and r one of the reasons they did so was because there w were not a lot of land opportunities in Belgium, and and so they came here really in search of what we would call the American dream, the better life, and and uh, there was a lot going on in the country, persecution, and so they kind of fled that and came here. Yeah, and there was a bit of a, a vacuum in terms of pastoral support uh, for the Belgian community yeah, um, oh yeah. that they didn't have enough priests. Uh, so really, at the time of this apparition, it seems like this is uh, you know, an answer to a prayer, so to say, of the faithful that you're given a, a rejuvenation in the faith and kind of given this person of Adele Breeze to recatechize and, yeah. and re-energize. Yeah, in fact, there was a priest from the Green Bay area that rode over to Belgium. Uh, his name was Father Peridin, I believe, and he's Father John Peridin, and he, he writes something to the fact of, are there any priests who can come with the immigrants because the people are becoming lackadaisical in the practice of their faith? Goodness. And so that's what he says. And uh, and then you have Mary appear and say, gather the children, teach them what they need to know for salvation. Well, this is the, the kind of the the recatechesis uh, of the people of you know mary talks about the sacraments and isn't it interesting that adele is sent out as a missionary gather the children teach them what they need to know she did that she went to all of these different places and and uh, she traveled within a 50 mile radius she knocked on doors did household work she wanted to teach the kids anything to fulfill that mission that she received but before she sent out, though, Mary says, pray for the conversion of sinners, offer your communion for that intention. So as she goes out on her missionary work, it's almost as if she's anticipating, mm -hmm. praying already in advance for those whom she was going to work for their conversion. Uh, it's kind of a beautiful little uh, message there uh, within Adele's life and within the, the message of Mary herself. Yeah. If we can jump to present day, where we are in the church, um, what do you think we can draw out of this apparition and draw out of Champion, the experience of Adele Breeze, the message from Our Lady, to help us come together and maybe focus on, on what is right and true in the faith? Well, there's a few things. The fact that Mary talks about conversion of life and there's a, a part of the message which, you know, controversial because it talks a little bit about chastisement. She says, if they do not convert into penance, my son will be obliged to punish them. But what I always point out there is that that's a conditional statement. If they don't, then, you know, then there will be punishment. It's the same thing in Fatima, you know, pray the rosary every day so that not a greater war will ever take place again. Yeah. And so if you don't listen, well, then something happens. So I think that we take that to heart then. Well, if they do not convert, well, do your best to convert your life. But there's a great promise at the end of Mary's message. Go and fear nothing, for I will help you. Mm -hmm. And so for us daily, call upon the help of Mary. We call her in Catholic theology the mediatrix of grace. And so ask for her prayers, ask for her intercession, ask for her to make your pleas known before God so that you might receive grace through her hands. So she wants to help us. That's what she promises. I will help you. And uh, I, I think that don't forget that. And that, you know, in all the battles we face, if we realize heaven is with us, well, then it makes the, makes the battle a little easier to endure, I suppose. The shrine at Champion is billed as a peaceful place, and it fits that bill. There are so many prayerful places, indoors and outside, meant to give pilgrims many options to connect with the faith. The grave of Adele Breeze is near to the lower level chapel on the site of the original apparition of Mary. It's a place where you can 
Consider all of the complicated things in your life and then try to get back to the relatively straightforward teachings of Jesus Christ and consider how those were expressed by Mary in the apparition. Father John Broussard of the Fathers of Mercy is the rector of the Champion Shrine. One of the things I love about the messages of Our Lady to Adele is the simplicity of them and the fact that, uh, yes, they were given to Adele, but there's a universal um, appeal, if you will, to all Catholics who would listen to them. The simple things like, I, I love how she, she really told Adele to, to do three things, you know, in terms of her ministry. And the first thing that she told her to do was teach the children how to sign themselves with the sign of the cross. I mean, uh, such a beautiful, simple thing to spread, you know, and so much theology is contained just in that, you know, the idea that uh, we worship the Trinity and that uh, uh, the second person of that Trinity is the, uh, is our Savior who died on the cross for us, you know, so, so much you can glean from just making the sign of the cross and how many of us every day make the sign of the cross how many times a day and don't don't think of it or don't realize it so i think as you say it's a call back to basics but probably even more fundamentally than that it's a call to faith it's a call to belief uh specifically catholic belief and i think now more than ever uh that's a universal call that all christians can relate to one of the things i really wanted to talk to father john about was how we connect the lessons in this apparition to today. Rural Wisconsin in the 19th century, with a lack of priests and language barriers with the immigrant population, could maybe be related to our modern world, with many people leaving the faith and secular culture and concerns become ever taller hurdles. You know, especially in our time of today, and the culture that we live in, I think you definitely see that attack on the faith. People are feeling more and more distant from their faith. And you know, one of the things that people say that they get most when they come here is just a sense of peace. You know, they, they, they're, they're out in the world, there's so much noise in the world, there's so many things that pull them away from God. This is an opportunity to come and, and sort of focus in on those higher realities, those spiritual truths that really matter. So that, I think the parallels are not only there, but intended by Our Lady. Mm. If we can stay with that a little bit, because it does seem like a, a tense time, I guess, in, in the country, but also in the church, that a lot of people have very strong beliefs about particular political issues or ideological issues, and not to get into those issues mm -hmm. to derail us from, from Our Lady, but what lessons can we draw from the apparition and from the lessons of Champion Wisconsin to help us now to come back to kind of the core belief and get away from the, the divisions? We can disagree, but we also need to keep, keep God in mind. Right? right, absolutely. Excellent question. And you know, something that Our Lady said to Adele, one of the three things that she told her was, teach the children how to approach the sacraments. Mm -hmm. Teach the children how to approach it. I like it that it's not teach the children the theology of their sacraments, right? She says, teach the children how to approach the sacraments. And I think that one of the things that she meant by that was teach the, the disposition, teach the, the, the overall sense of the faith in which we recognize that there are certain things that are higher realities, there are certain truths that are, are more important than others. You know, something that I think across the world, not just the United States, but across the world, something that we were all awakened to was the weakness of our faith. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, the pandemic wipes, you know, spreads all across the world. And uh, what happens, you know, we, we turn away from God in so many instances. Um, I think that that was an important realization for us. Uh, and making uh, Our Lady's message to Adele all the more relevant, teach the children how to approach the sacraments. Well, that's going to mean approaching the sacraments with great faith, great belief, that I believe that these are the instruments of my salvation, and they're more important than anything that uh, I could go through or suffer or experience here on this earth. Mm -hmm. There were headwinds, modern headwinds to the faith, even before the pandemic. And then churches shut down. And 
of course, there are digital offerings. I know my family took advantage of that, but it's not the same as, as going to Mass every week and, and taking communion and celebrating. Um, can you talk about maybe that next step of trying to make up the ground that was lost during the pandemic and still approaching the sacraments uh, while maybe, yeah, doing it double time, right? To, to make, up, make up ground from before, but now the pandemic sure. as well. You know, it, we always talk about God brings good out of evil, right? And so what I would encourage anyone who is, you know, looking to re-engage in their faith would be, number one, take from this last, these last 18 months or so that we've been all suffering through this uh, pandemic, uh, to take, a, take time to, to do that, that re-evaluation of my own faith life, you know. Did I take my faith for granted? You know, there's nothing like having, being forced away from it to actually realize how important it was to you. So take that opportunity to say, did I really appreciate the Eucharist like I should have? Mm -hmm. Did I really appreciate my faith as I should have? And the great uh, opportunities and peace and direction that it offered to me. And, and then now with that, um, with, with that reinvigoration of that desire to exercise my faith more fully, do so. Frequent confession, you know, one of the things we try to offer confessions, you know, at least three times a day here, every day at the shrine, you know, uh, to afford people that opportunity to exercise that sacrament. I mean, even during the pandemic, when we weren't allowed to offer mass, mm -hmm. we still had confessions and, you know, the church was open. We wanted people to still have that connection to the sacraments. Uh, so push into that, come back to that, and, and make that a, an ever-renewed aspect of your, of your faith life. You know, come back to Mass with that, that understanding of uh, the higher realities that we're all being called to. Um, just like Our Lady said to Adele, um, you know, she, she told her, teach the children of this wild country what they need to know for salvation. This wild country is the world, right? You know, it's, it's, it's this life that we experience. It's filled with peril, uh, but if we know what we need for salvation, um, namely Jesus and the sacraments and his church, uh, then we will find peace even in the midst of that. One of the recurring themes in some of the interviews I've done uh, for this piece is a pilgrimage can be done anywhere that, of course, you would like many pilgrims to come to Champion, and it's beautiful, uh, but you can also make a pilgrimage wherever you are, that you can make an intentional act to come to Christ and, and to pray. Um, and I wonder if you can talk more about that, just exercising uh, intention in faith that, yes, you can come to Champion and you're more than welcome, but you can also go to local parishes or, or soup kitchens or what have you and make an intentional act to be with your faith. Right. Uh, that's an excellent point. The, uh, a pilgrimage is, is um, an, a sacramental. It's an aspect of the treasures of the church. Really what it is, is it's an external representation of what should be internal realities. So if I am uh, feeling that call from Christ to go closer to him, stepping out and actually walking to a church or in some form of a pilgrimage is a, an external manifestation of that. But it really should be reflect what's going on interiorly. Mm -hmm. So you're absolutely right. You know, if just, just taking the time to go to church, to your parish, to, uh, to, to make that... Um, that effort, that external effort of uh, expressing your love for God and your desire to, to know him more intimately, uh, th that, would be, that would be wonderful. Now, uh, places like this offer um, sort, of, sort of, I guess you could say, some, some concentrated <laughs> uh, uh, devotionals <laughs> right. that you could, you could pursue uh, by uh, you know, coming specifically for um, you know, learning of the apparition and the history and things like that. That can, that can be helpful in terms of uh, boosting and uh, strengthening your faith. But uh, uh, no, you're, you're absolutely right. A pilgrimage, it, it starts here and then it's expressed in, um, in an external way. That's great. Uh, and just to close, is there anything else 
you think people should keep in mind, either about the idea of pilgrimage or specifically about this place and, and what happened, you know, 150 years ago and what's still happening here today? The, the shrine has always been, a, as we said, a place of peace, uh, but it's also a place of healing. Um, people who come here, they experience spiritual healing and, yes, sometimes physical healing. You know, they, they, we've had people, uh, re they've received favors of freedom from cancer, or, you know, freedom from uh, even emotional or mental uh, struggles. You know, they, they, they've come here and, and really experienced, you know, that, that presence of God. And all of that is a result of faith. You know, all of that is a result of people stepping out and, and just like the woman who reached out for our Lord, the tassel of his cloak, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if only I could touch the tassel of his cloak. And the Lord actually felt that power mm -hmm. come from him. I think that's what people experience here. They experience that power kind of sort of come forth from God uh, by making the effort to come here and to experience that and to express that. So uh, never underestimate the, uh, the effect that expressing that internal intention of your faith can have on you and on those around you. So if you're, if you're ever considering making that pilgrimage, it, it's worth it. Father, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for listening to this second episode from our pilgrimage to Wisconsin. There is one more coming with a little more from Father Edward Looney about roadside chapels and places to pray. The, the roadside chapels are kind of this European devotion. And the, the idea was if you can't go to church every day, well, you could stop here and pray. If you're passing by, well, why not just stop and say a Hail Mary? It was really the faith that was the devotion of the people. We'll have more on that in our next episode. Until then, please share this episode with anyone you think might benefit from it. And please reach out with comments or ideas for future episodes. And also, please have a great day.